Today, we'll discuss some proposed personal finance federal rules that were announced in the April 2024 budget. We'll talk about the areas the media didn't talk about. Let's begin. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Before we start the show, I've got breaking news. On Wednesday, May 8th, we will be releasing a full-length documentary that explores the history and nature of debt in Canada. We interview a bunch of outside experts, Ted and I give our thoughts, and we've got archival footage and pictures going back as far as the 1890s. I remember the 1890s. I know you do. That's That's why we put that in, just for you. (laughs) Speak louder. What? What? There's a lot of stuff you've never seen before. It'll be better than any documentary you'll watch on TV this year, and it's free on YouTube. No commercials. May 8th, right here on the Debt Free and 30 YouTube channel. So click the subscribe and notification button now so you're notified of every podcast. See, I got the commercial in right at the very beginning. And we've started signing autograph pictures in advance in anticipation. Absolutely, That's right. So that's May the 8th. Now, most of our listeners are audio listeners. Why why do you think that would be? They don't want to watch us? Do you think that? What's what's, I've got a perfect face for radio. So we get a lot more listeners on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Amazon Music. Did you know there was such a thing as Amazon Music? (laughs) There is. People listen to us on Amazon Music. Is that another Bezos thing? Uh, Yes, it is. Okay. And there's about a hundred other audio platforms. I actually looked it up. A hundred different audio platforms that people listen to this. But podcast you want to see this, right? Exactly. The pot, the documentary. You want to see it because of all the you know graphs and charts and people and everything. Right. So again, you got to watch it on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on the audio version, go over to YouTube right now, Debt Free and Thirty Channel. Click subscribe, and you will you will be notified. Okay. Now on with the show. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, and I'm going to start with a mini rant because I'm wearing a suit. All right, I'll just just get comfortable over here. You can have a little snooze here, and then we'll get into the specifics. So I'm going to put timestamps in the show notes. So if you want to skip ahead, (laughs) hey, I only want to hear about that thing. Great. Skip ahead. And it's going to be a link so they can download the budget, right? All 500 pages of it? It's there. It's absolutely (laughs) there. So we're uh, going to talk. We're going to end the show talking about the government's proposal to have rent payments reported to the credit bureau. And I know you've got some opinions on that. So, right. so Ted, will, Ted will do a lot of talking uh, on then. So again, you want to skip ahead to that, use the timestamps. On April 16th, 2024, seems like it was only last week, mm-hmm. the federal government released the federal budget and the media has covered it extensively. So we're only going to touch on the important points they didn't because nobody really cares. So speaking of caring, why should anyone care what is in the federal budget? Well, if you're going to care about anything that the government does, the way they spend your money is probably the single most important thing to care about. And the budget's supposed to tell you what their plans are for the future. Money. It all comes down to money. I Always follow the money. (laughs) And I'm hoping that everyone who is listening to this towards the end of April has already filed their 2023 taxes. Of course they have. And got their refund. (laughs) Exactly. So you should know exactly how much you paid in taxes last year. So I I went on to an online calculator. Mm -hmm. If you're an employee and you make $50,000, single person, living in Ontario, you'll pay roughly $4,500 in federal tax. 2300 in provincial tax, 3600 in CPP and EI premiums for a total of $10,400. So you don't really make 50000 you net just under 396 Okay. And of course, people are going to say, well, CPP and EI, those are taxes. Uh, well, try not paying them <laughs> and see if they're taxes or Keep not. Keep ranting. Um, now, of course, Everyone's going to say, yeah, but I get the carbon tax credit credit rebate thing. Most of you do. That's true. 140 bucks per uh, single person every three months. So that's 560 bucks a year. But of course, you're also paying HST. So right. you pay a lot of taxes. That's my point. Okay. Okay. Point number two. I actually read this thing. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, I have printed it out double-sided. Right. I didn't think the pile looked big enough, that's but why, that's why. That's why you can still see us. It's We're not buried in the budget. There's a two-page forward, a nine-page table of contents, and then the budget document itself is 416 pages. Took me like a bunch of parts of three days to get through the thing. I'm probably the only person in Canada who actually read it. Probably. If, if you know, Let's be honest here. I counted 215 places where the budget proposes to spend more money. Mm-hmm. That's not this is new spending. It's not all the stuff that they're already spending money on. Right. I counted 54 different pieces of federal legislation that are impacted by the budget. Because if you had asked me, I would have said, well, obviously it impacts the Income Tax Act. This is all about taxes, right? That's right. one. Mm-hmm. You know, 54. Let me read you one of them. <laughs> okay. So everyone can fall asleep. This is from page 410. Quote, in budget 2024, the government proposes to introduce legislative amendments to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development Agreement Act and 
the International Development Financial Institutions Assistance Act. Have you heard of either one of those before? Is this a post-World War II thing? What the Apparently. <laughs> to provide the authorities to purchase hybrid capital, provide guarantees, or use other innovative financial instruments, blah, 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 blah. To support future initiatives or regional, multinational, multilateral development banks. In addition, the government proposes to amend the Bretton Woods and Related Agreements Act to increase the amount that Canada is permitted to pay the International Monetary Fund for quota subscriptions. Now, I have no idea what any of that means. You, of course, are, remember the Bretton Woods Conference. I'm sure I was there. From 1944, <laughs> and that's when they sort of created the uh, the financial system that we, we use. Right. But I had no idea that we passed the Bretton Woods and Related Agreements Act in 1995 and have continued to amend it. And this budget amends it again. Hmm. So, huh, that's what I said. Huh, how about that? Okay, this is really boring. So, let's, right. let's, let's move on here. You and I... Started Hoyes, Michaels, and Associates 25 years ago. I remember that. Remember that vividly. It was a January. It was, in fact. <laughs> it was, in fact. I believe it was January, January 4th. 4th. Yes, that's, right. that's correct. And every single client we have ever met with, we end up doing a budget. And right. I counted it up. We have uh, opened almost 70,000 new files. I can believe that. And of course, we meet with more people than what who actually file with us. Right. So it would not surprise me if between the two of us, you and I, we've looked at over 100,000 budgets. That's a reasonable guess. Because you got to know what's going on. So right. what is a budget? Give me the real simple definition of it. Right. So effectively, it's a plan for how you're going to spend your money. So how much have you got coming in? That's the income side of a budget. How much money is going out? Those are the expenses. And the budget is simply income minus expenses to tell you what you got. Ins and outs. This right. is really simple. So is there a page in this budget that shows you the ins and the outs? I would be willing to bet not a chance. No. <laughs> the closest they get is on pages 365 and 366, where they have a little line that shows revenues and a line that shows expenses, but there's no detail. It's only half a page, so it's not easy to see where they are actually spending the money. The lines ever actually meet. No, these are, <laughs> these are clearly parallel lines. Right. Now, on page 21 and on page 361, they show the deficit projection for the next six years. Well, which that's is useful. 40, never, $40 billion for the next few years. Never been right, but okay. And it never gets close to being balanced. But anyways, that's another story. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not naive. I realize this is a marketing document. Well, so a budget is a policy statement. Policy statements are driven by politics. So yes, you're right. It's a marketing budget. Yeah, and every... Government does it. Sure. It doesn't matter if you're liberal or conservative, federal, provincial, whatever. It might matter to me, but <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it's <laughs> they all do the same thing. So Correct. if if some new guy gets elected two years from now, he will also put out the same kind of document that will exactly. have a whole bunch of fluff in it. So um so that's where we go. Okay, now let's get into some specifics. And I want to start with things that I think actually aren't stupid. Okay. And then we'll get it. Should into be a short conversation. It'll be pretty short. So page 343, mm -hmm. they have... Wait a minute, you took you 343 okay, pages well, to get something that wasn't yeah, stupid, okay. You know, so that's pretty good. <laughs> Automatic tax filing for low-income Canadians. What does that mean? Well, I'll read it to you. Canadians should be able to easily and quickly receive the benefits to which they are entitled. However, lower-income Canadians as well as younger Canadians may not receive their benefits, such as the Canada Child Benefit, Canada Carbon Rebate, if they don't file a tax return. So... Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, in February 2024, CRA increased the number of eligible Canadians for simple file by phone, formerly known as file my return, mm -hmm. because the government always changes the names of stuff. Well, that's how you market things. Exactly. It's called the Canada Carbon Rebate, but last month, wasn't it called the Climate Action Incentive yeah, Payment? But nobody understood that. Exactly. I'm sure you understand what the Canada Carbon I do not, Rebate is. I do not understand it. So they've increased it to one and a half million people, more right. than double the number of people eligible, eligible last year. CRA is on track to increase this number to 2 million by 2025. Does that mean that the government thinks that they're 2 million low-income Canadians? Yes. Wouldn't it's, they be better off to increase their income? Well, That's a different conversation. Yes, <clears throat> but I agree that if you, I don't think it's a distinction between low-income, high-income. I right. think it's, is your situation relatively simple? Right. So you could be an employee making a million dollars a year. You get one T4 that has a million dollars on it. Right. That's a simple tax return. Mm-hmm. So my opinion is, 
as a taxpayer, I should be able to log into my CRA account, which already has all the numbers because my T4 and everything's right. in there. And just put submit. Exactly. Yep, that all looks good to me. Yep. Hit submit. Now, maybe I've got a rent receipt or a charitable donation receipt. Yeah, some medical bills, maybe. Medical something. bills, whatever. But wouldn't that cover 80% of Canadians? Probably. So is there a reason why they're not doing that? Hmm, not that I can think not of. Not that we can think of. So so there you go. So I'm of the view that they should. So that's a good uh, one. They should, you know, and expand that. Do our friends at TurboTax and H&R Block, how do they feel about that? They will that? not feel good about that because obviously it's taking work and, and accountants in general. Right. And I think if you have a complicated tax situation, then you probably need to have some professional advice. Right. But if it's a case of I've got a T4, then why not just go in and say, yep, CRA, you got all my numbers, boom, and here we go. Make it happen. The other thing they're proposing is a single sign-in portal for government services. Okay, now this will blow your mind. Again, I'm quoting from the budget. Right. Canadians and businesses shouldn't have to remember multiple passwords because we're not that smart. However, <laughs> there are currently over 60 different Government of Canada systems, each requiring their own separate login and passwords to access. Do you believe that? I do believe I that. I do believe that as well. <laughs> that is too many. Mm -hmm. So we're going to spend uh, 25 million bucks trying to combine all these things. How much did they spend on I the arrive, know, the arrive know, drive that was, cards can thing? That was thing. $80 million, I believe. But it was budgeted for how much? Uh, well, I could have done it for probably 50 bucks right. with an off-the-shelf <clears throat> thing. So, okay, I think in conceptually, we all agree I shouldn't have to go to 12 different places. Right. In practice, good luck. And I, are they talking, well, I guess, it, does it say if it's for all government services? Because I remember back when I was on the board of a couple of health agencies, that the government was spending millions of dollars at that time, and this is 20 years ago, on single access point for medical. It's yeah, never happened. It's never so. happened. And, and again, it's it's the government. So right. again, good but idea. But you like it. It's a good idea. I like okay. it. Good idea. They're also going to reduce CRA call center wait times. So they're just going to drop the calls after 30 seconds? Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> Budget 2024 proposes to provide $336 million over two years to CRA to maintain call center resources and improve efficiency. Okay. Well, we're all, we're all in favor of being able to call someone. Right. Again, call me in two years. I'll see if it worked. Okay. Now let's get into some stuff that is relevant to the people who are watching. So for those of you who skipped ahead for the first 11 minutes, welcome back. Here we go. Right. Page 155 of the budget proposes capping non-sufficient fund fees at $10. Mm -hmm. So what is an NSF fee? How does that work? Man, when does what, it happen? What the bank charges you if they're not sufficient funds in your account to cover a withdrawal or a payment that you've made. So uh, most of the major banks now, it's somewhere between 40 and $50 a hit. Yes. And so... The, the the budget says these fees charged by banks can reach almost 50 bucks, which is what you just dis said, mm -hmm. disproportionately affecting low-income Canadians and people with poor credit history. Because $50 means more to a low-income Canadian than to a high-income Canadian. Well, yes, and if you have a million dollars in your bank account, you're probably not bouncing a payment. Well, Whereas if you're living paycheck to paycheck, much more likely. Right. So what they want to propose is to help Canadians who are struggling the government is announcing its intent to cap the NF NSF fees charged by banks to $10 per instance, as well as requiring banks to alert customers that they are about to be charged an NSF fee and providing a grace period to deposit additional funds, prohibiting multiple NSF fees when the same transaction occurs. Because if I've got three payments going out today, one right. of them bounces, the other two are going to bounce as well. Restricting, restricting the number of NSF fees that may be charged to one every 72 hours and prohibiting NSF fees for small overdrawn amounts under $10. Right. The government will release draft NSF regulations in the coming months. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, it, it sounds like a good soundbite. We're going to help the little guy because we're not going to charge him, let the banks charge him the fees because the banks are making record profits. Um, the downside, of course, is there really are costs associated with doing this, and implementing some of these changes are going to be more expensive. And more importantly, if there are no consequences to a a non-sufficient item check, then is this actually going to stop people from doing it? Or will they do it more? And I don't think people deliberately are bouncing checks. A very small percentage. Um, it's, you know <clears throat> what, I didn't realize that payment was coming out today. I thought it was coming out tomorrow. I thought I was got it covered, whatever. So right. um, my worry is the bank will just find some other way to make money. So I guess well, we'll, we'll see. So they'll, maybe the differential on interest rates will be increased. So on deposits versus what the bank's actually making. But yeah, I don't. Or think, there'll be minimum fees on your accounts. I don't. Yep, yeah, that would be the other, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as well. So, right. in fact, let's talk about it right now. Page one hundred and fifty-six: mm -hmm. enhancing free and affordable bank accounts. 
Okay, now you mentioned the word sound bite. So I right. want everyone to keep that in mind <laughs> while I read this. Canadians banking, and again, I'm quoting from the budget, page 156. You can play the home game and follow along with me. Canadians banking needs have changed as more and more transactions happen online. Yep, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. The $0 per month and up to $4 per month bank accounts currently offered by some of Canada's banks need to reflect the reality of banking today, including more transactions to pay bills and transfer money without extra fees. So Budget 2024 announces that FCAC, which is the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, is in negotiations with banks to secure enhanced agreements to offer modernized $0 per month and up to $4 per month bank accounts that reflect the realities of banking today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that sounds like a beautiful soundbite. Well, yeah. Why, is the, why do you think the government's picking on the banks all of a sudden? Well, because they're a, a nice target. Because everybody hates the banks? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's read the next page. Let's go to page 157. Okay. Where the government admits... That this already exists. Right. So the market got, has established it. The market is already. So they've got a blurb right on there on page 157 that says, anyone can get a low-cost bank account. But features are limited. But features are limited. Because it's low cost. Well, and so the, the, they say that we encourage banks to, uh, you know, do things, but they already exist. You can get a right. free debit card, 12 free debit transactions per month, the ability to write checks, free monthly printed statements, the ability to set up pre-authorized payments, and check image return or online check viewing. Okay, so if I can already get that, Why then... Why do we need to legislate it? Right. Now, as you know, Ted, we do not have sponsors on this this podcast. And we're not going to get any banks after no, this. No, this is well, actually, highly unlikely. We're on the bank side for this one, actually. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm on my own side. I'm right. really, you know, a, a program. I mean, and we, we did actually have, uh, you know, our friends out in uh, out west there, uh, Bueller and Associates. Wayne sent us, you know, uh, some, pens some pens and some stuff and everything. So I guess he's kind of the sponsor of this show. <laughs> but you're right. The uh, the banks will not be, be sponsoring this one. Right. But I will mention some banks' names. Okay. Even though they're not sponsors that do offer basically free accounts. Simply, <laughs> Tangerine, well simple, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of credit credit unions and and you know, sure. if you have enough and these are like free accounts. Yeah, and they're for everybody they're as for opposed everybody. to just for the youth, the students, the seniors. Right. So, mm -hmm. and again, the 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 title of the budget was Fairness for Every Generation. And so the government is trying to, you know, drive us against each other because the old people are getting too much. The young people are getting too much, whatever. Right. And so they've said that, well, sure, the banks do have special accounts if you're a youth or a student or a senior or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, no, those banks that I just mentioned already have free accounts. Now, I realize that those are virtual banks. You can't right. walk in and see them. But but that's the modern thing that we're talking right, about. We, yeah, we, they just said yeah, that. So. You don't need to be going into a branch if all you need is someplace to process your transactions. Exactly. So it, this seems to me like the government taking credit for something that already exists. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. But again, people can put their notes in the comments if they disagree. Right. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about cell phone fees. We're going to skip over this because, I don't know, I just don't right. really care. Um, yeah. The... The government has taken, again, I'm quoting, the government has taken significant action to lower the cost of cell phone plans by 25%, a commitment that has now been surpassed. In December 2023, Statistics Canada reported that cell phone plan costs declined by 50% since December 2018. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but if they're already coming down, then... Why do we? Well... Right. And and what they're saying is, yeah, but they charge a lot of money for U.S. roaming and international roaming and everything else. Well... Okay, but that's not your basic cell phone plan when you're, you know, trying to call your kids. So, and, and I'm just, I'm thinking back now, those are all included in our basic plan. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Oh, whatever. Okay, now let's get to the good one. <clears throat> okay. Page 65, credit for paying rent. And so this is kind of the major topic that we will, we will spend the rest of the show on. Again, I'm quoting. Every month, millions of Canadian renters pay their rent in full and on time. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. The government thinks that should count towards their credit worthiness when applying for their first mortgage, seeking to refinance a mortgage, and in many other situations that require credit evaluations. For young Canadians and newcomers to Canada, this is even more important as they have a more difficult time establishing credit history. Okay, I don't disagree with any of that. More Gen Z and millennials are renting today than the generations that came before them with over 54% of people between 25 and 34 years old being renters. Okay, that kind of makes sense. And that number jumps to 81% for people under 24 years old. 
Yeah, because most 18-year-olds are not going out and buying a house. They weren't right. doing that in my day either. In comparison, 25% of Canadians between 55 and 65, 64 years old are renters today. By making renters' payments count, we can help younger Canadians get ahead. Hmm. Okay. Budget 2024, the government is setting a firm expectation. Okay, Ted, a firm right. expectation. They said no. Well, then I said firmly. Firm. Firm. We must. Firm. No. Firm okay. expectation with lenders through its strengthened Canada Mortgage Charter. Mm-hmm. Boy, this is a marketing document. To take a renter's on-time payment history into account when performing credit evaluations for mortgage applications. Budget 2024 announces that the government is calling on right. banks, fintechs, and credit bureaus to prioritize launching tools to allow renters to opt in to report their rent payment history to credit bureaus to strengthen their credit scores and unlock pathways for more renters to become homeowners. Together, this ability to strengthen one credit score with on-time rental payment history and make it easier to qualify for a mortgage or, or even a lower rate works in parallel to the government's efforts to advance consumer-driven banking. Okay, so... You can you can start wherever you want here. My opinion is this sounds really good in theory, but right. in practice, er, yeah. The more you think about it, the worse it gets. So give me one area where you thought about it, and it's like, uh, what about this? Well, the most obvious thing is that the credit bureaus are for-profit companies run by their members. That means the the banks, anyone who wants to report onto the credit bureau needs to be a member of the bureau so they can get access to that information. Does that mean that the I mean, the 50% of people that live in properties owned by the huge land developers, that's going to be easy. Big corporation can join. But the 50% that live in smaller developers units, you know, like the student living in somebody's basement or the guy who has three rental properties in uh, Sudbury, uh, these guys all going to join the credit bureau and they're going to report every month. They don't have the systems in place to do it anyway. I agree. And we had your pal Blair DeMarco Wetlawfer was on the show a few weeks ago and he he explained, and we weren't talking about this specifically, but he right. explained how he reports as a collection agent to the credit bureau. Mm-hmm. And he said there's this very, you know, s- specific data field, d- data format right. that you have to send. It's got to meet their system. So yeah. you got to put it in the way they can read it. Right. It's got to have the first name and the last name and this many yep. characters. And, da, 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 da. and so he said it took us a bit of time to make sure we had the exact correct data file because if we send it to the credit bureau and it's not right, then it gets bumped back. Makes sense. Now, of course, he's reporting many thousands of things mm-hmm. every every month so right. he can afford to make sure it's right. But your example is exactly right. You're some guy who rents out their basement because mm-hmm. the cost of housing is so high, I need the help. And so you've got a tenant in there. How are you going to report to the credit bureau every month? Like, right. How is that going to work? Well, I guess the credit bureau could have a portal and you could log in and you could put, you yeah. know, my name is Ted and I'm the and, landlord. And, and you think that's going to happen? No. That sounds to me like it will reduce the number of available rental spaces and rather increase. Well, and, and as a landlord, are you going to remember to do that on the first day of every month? No. Let's be more Machiavellian than that. It's as a landlord, if you get pissed at your tenant, what are you going to report? Wow, okay. So now, <laughs> now we're getting into the good stuff here. Right. So, so your tenant um, has a... I don't know. No, it, they, they cook with too much garlic. They cook with... Comes through the floor. You're smelling it all the okay, time. You know, I like garlic, so I wouldn't report them for that. But okay, I get you. So they've got <laughs> they've got too much... You know, there's, there's some issue. And so you decide, well, you know what? I'm going to stick it to you. Right. I'm going to report... I'm going to report something negative. Um, and what are you as a tenant going to do? Well, there's the dispute resolution process, I assume, would be in place for... The, that would apply to this as everything else. Sure, there would be. Assuming you check to see that it's happening to you. Okay, you you want to get Machiavellian here. So I'm a landlord, mm-hmm. which I'm not. You're not. <laughs> but if I was, I'd say, okay, Ted, you're my tenant, mm-hmm. and I understand you want good credit. So here's the deal. You pay an extra 100 bucks a month on your rent. And I'll make your credit look great. Exactly. I'll report everything is beautiful and everything yep. great. So, hmm, as a tenant, I might actually go for that because there's all these credit repair things out there. Particularly if you are a young Canadian or new Canadian and you're not familiar with how things are supposed to work. Maybe in your home country, that's how things actually Mm -hmm. did work, right? Yeah, because we're, this is really targeting people who probably don't have a team of lawyers working for them. Right. So. Uh, They don't have a credit history. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. Okay. My other question, how much difference is this actually going to make? Depends on how much weight the credit grantors give that, right? Okay, I agree. And so how does weight work? Well, there's something called utilization. So if Mm -hmm. you have a credit card with a $10,000 authorized limit and you're only using 1000 bucks of it, that's 10% utilization. That makes your score look pretty good. Right. How do you calculate utilization for rent? 
they'd have to build something into the formula that says, and this is how rental history is going to impact the numbers. Because it has nothing to do with utilization. Right. right? And you're not actually being granted credit because if you don't pay, they throw you out. Right. <laughs> so if I'm paying $1,000 a month in rent, does that affect my credit differently than 2000 a month in rent? Right. Like exactly how does it, I don't know. I don't know how. Well, and because you can pay $1,000 a month in rent, does that mean you're going to pay a $2,500 a monthly mortgage payment? Like what's the correlation? What's the correlation? <clears throat> well, and the, the, the most close analogy I can give to this would be your cell phone bill. So right. if you don't pay your cell phone bill, the big cell phone guys can report to the credit bureau that you didn't pay it. Right. And that certainly harms your credit score. Because your cell phone bill is 100 bucks a month. If you're late with that, it's like, well, that's pretty bad. Right. So now if you pay your cell phone bill every time on time, it has no real effect. You're not, you're not, you don't get 50 extra points. It's on your just an score. extra item on your score that looks good. Right. Yeah. But it's really has no weight at all because it's 100 bucks a month. Yeah. So missing the payment hurts a lot more than making the payment. Well, and, and so relate that to, to the rent here. I think the... But, for every person that this helps, it's going to hurt. So the guy who pays his rent two or three days late, or he pays his rent every Friday when he gets, you know, a quarter of a time at, because that's the only way he can budget for it, or something else has gone wrong and, okay, he only has to pay $10 for his NSFs, but he bounced his rent, so that's going to have a credit impact anyway. I think for every person this helps, there's going to be at least one person that it hurts. What do you, I agree. And w so what do you do? You, you mentioned student housing. So... I'm in a, I'm in a, whatever, student housing with five other people. I noticed that. You know, it's yeah, a little right. strange for somebody your age, but it kind happens. Weird. Kind of weird. Like, <clears throat> so whose name gets reported to the credit bureau? Well, yeah. Did they all sign the lease? That means all five of them have to get reported? Or did one guy sign the lease and if his buddies don't pay, he's out of luck? And so maybe we all did sign the lease and we're all putting in 500 bucks a month. And, but Joe didn't put in his 500 this month. So do we all get hammered on our credit score? Right. I'll go back to your Machiavellian thing. If Joe is the lead guy on the lease, does he charge each of you more? Because he's the one that's taking responsibility. Probably. <laughs> of course. He's a, he's a business student. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, and, and what about a more simple case where it's, you know, uh, husband and wife? We're renting. Yep. So are both names on the lease? Maybe, but probably it's one of them. Right. So one of them gets the credit. One of them doesn't. One of them hurt. Like there's a whole bunch of, of, of different things. So, uh, But it's always the devil in the details. The right. real question is, is it going to be enough of a benefit to offset all of these things that we think are detriments? So if you were the guy writing this 419 page document, would you have included that? Would you have done something different? Like how, how well, would you? But if the premise is that it's a marketing um, exercise as opposed to anything real. It's a great, it sounds good. When you heard it the first time, it was, hey, this sounds pretty good. And then the more we thought about it, the worse it got. Well, and credit bureaus are provincially regulated. Well, and they're also for-profit corporations. I mean, they're subsidiaries of U.S. corporations. So does the federal government have any sway at all in a how a provincially regulated for-profit corporation does business? Do you want to do a show on the federal government giving the cities monies mm. and how the provinces reacted to that? Well, there's <laughs> that to me is a slightly different issue. It is, of course. Because the federal mm. government says, okay, one of our jobs is we give out money. Right. So there's a line in the budget probably a few pages about healthcare mm -hmm. and healthcare under the constitution is a provincial responsibility, but the federal government agrees. Yeah. We, everybody should get roughly equal service throughout the country. They collect more money through taxes. So we will redistribute exactly. it. To the equitable. So here you go, Ontario, here right. you go, Quebec, here's your money. Um, you got to spend it in a reasonable manner, but we're, we're going to give it to you. Um, the credit bureau is different in that it's regular. There's no money from the federal government or the provincial government going to right. them, and it's provincially regulated. So, can the government make rules to? Wow. So this maybe this is just the opening salvo, and they're actually going to legislate national credit bureaus in Canada. Well, and they did do that with your favorite topic, <laughs> payday loans, which is payday loans, because also in the budget, they'd already previously announced this, right. they are amending the credit criminal code so that the maximum payday loan can only be $14 on a hundred. Mm. And it hasn't actually happened yet. We're still waiting for the regulations and everything. Right. But up until now, it's 
there was a carve out in the federal criminal code to give provincial jurisdiction to that. Right. Now the federal government said, no, no, we're taking that over too. Yep. Okay. So I guess they can do it, but. Well, I could see advantages to that, frankly, because we, I mean, <laughs> yes. the, we're going to have more topics about credit bureaus in the future. Yeah. But I think it's a mess. Yeah. Well, <laughs> most of the information, sadly, we see is wrong. Right. That's just the reality of it. Now, maybe it's because we're dealing with people with credit challenges and people who've got perfect credit don't have those issues, but we see it. We see it all the time. So, right. so okay. So I guess your opinion is the same as mine that, you know, it, it sounds good, um, but we are worried about the unintended consequences. Right. Who is going to get hurt by this? And is it going to hurt them more than the people that are going to benefit? And I think it's going to. Yeah, so. because you miss one rent payment. Well, now it's on your permanent record. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, well, it's well, not it's there. worse. It's on your permanent record. And if you need to move, the next landlord's going to know you've had rent payment problems in yeah. the past too. And so it becomes a, a vicious spiral. Right. So um, I guess my concluding comment on all this is I agree that all these things are problems. Absolutely. But are we treating the symptom? Or are we treating the underlying problem? Right. We don't have enough housing. We got way too high inflation. Interest rates are wacky. I mean, there's a whole, you know, government spending is way too high. There's a whole bunch of issues that cause all these problems. These are the band-aids on top of it. And we'll always have those issues. And if they were, weren't were there, we'd have other issues that are just the same. It's, so It's kind of the way it's, it is. It's the way the game is played. Well, so on that happy, <laughs> happy note, note, thanks, uh, thanks all for, for coming out. Um, I will put links in the show notes to what we talked about, including to the budget. You can go and download it. I would not recommend you print it out because I think that's bad for the environment. Can you put a page counter on there so we know how many of our ding, listeners ding, ding, actually ding, ding. go to check it out? Um, my mm. my prediction will be zero because, <laughs> like, why would you? But right. um, we've already explained why we think it's uh, not a bad idea. So I'll also put some other other links to stuff we've talked about. Um so you can you can uh, see it all for yourself. So again, final reminder, May, May 8th, we release our new full-length documentary. So please subscribe and hit the notification bell on YouTube so you don't miss it. Um, you've seen the first 15 minutes of it. It's pretty yes, good. It's it is pretty, pretty good. good. So uh, we're, uh, we're looking forward to that. And of course, you'll be notified of all future episodes of Debt Free in 30. That is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30.